Greetings fellow nerds and welcome to the video one in a three-part mini-series in celebration of the Hoist the Sails update, which brings, among many things, the introduction of two new turrets. This got me thinking, how can I compare these turrets objectively? Which led to other questions like, how does a turret work? How is the damage calculated? What factors influence damage and where do they come from? In this video, I'm going to show you the tools I use to explore the game files, and I'm going to go digging through the code with you, and show you the relevance of the numbers we find. We're going to take a detailed look at how the code is organized, and how the setup influences the way damage works. And we're going to tear down the various mechanisms the game uses to determine what hurts, and what doesn't. If this sounds interesting to you, buckle up, because it's time to get nerdy. While you can open the game files in pretty much any text editor out there, what you really want is an IDE, or Integrated Development Environment. There are literally dozens of options of IDE, but if you don't have a favorite, I highly recommend Microsoft Visual Studio Code, or VS Code. If you're using VS Code and you want to follow along, you're going to need the XML Tools extension in particular. And if you want your IDE to look exactly like mine, you'll also want the OLED Black theme installed as well. Thankfully, VS Code makes this easy. Open VS Code, click on the four square icon here at the middle left of the screen. This will open up the extensions panel and there's a search bar at the top. Search for XML tools and look for this icon. It should be pretty close to the top. When you find it, click this little blue install button here to add this extension to your VS Code. Then search for the OLED black theme and do the same. Once the theme is loaded, you'll see a pop-out menu at the top of the screen that's waiting for you to hit enter to commit to the new theme. With those installed, you're ready to do some diving. But before we head down the digital rabbit hole, I want to clarify something first. Fire up your favorite web browser, head over to github.com, and search for Barotrauma up here. Look for the name Regalis11 and open up the repository. This is the source code that drives Barotrauma. Now here's the point I want to make. This code, written in a language called Cascading Style Sheets, drives the manifestation, behavior, and rendering of in-game elements. But the properties of those elements, the attributes that define them, the images they're rendered with, and the values that govern the limits are all defined elsewhere. This CSS code here drives the animation and behavior of the reactor, for example. But first it needs to know how much power the reactor can generate, how fast it consumes fuel, what it's connected to and how much power those things are consuming, etc. It needs game data to run. That game data is defined in XML format, and those files can be found locally, as in on your computer. XML, or Extensible Markup Language, is an hierarchical format used for storing, transmitting, and reconstructing arbitrary data. XML is great for communicating the attributes of a reactor, but by itself it cannot animate, evolve, or generate behavior based on the information it contains. It needs code to make use of the information it holds. Throughout this video I will be referring to GitHub from time to time, but we're going to spend the majority of the time looking through these XML files. Why? Well, for the most part, you can guess how the values in the XML files are going to influence the game based on their location and title but it's harder to predict the behavior from the CSS code by itself. Now, before we get back to VS Code, we need to know precisely where those game files are found. The easiest way to do this is to go to Steam, open up your library, and right-click on the Barotrauma icon on the panel to the left. In the menu that pops up, click Manage, and then click Browse Local Files. In the file browser that pops up, copy the path, and then switch back to VS Code. From here, open the file menu in the menu bar, select open folder, and paste that path you just copied in here. Once you hit enter, you'll notice that this panel now has a bar with the same name as the folder you just loaded. If it's not expanded already, click the right facing chevron just beside the folder title here, and you'll see a file tree containing all the local game files used by Barotrauma. Our path today starts in the content folder. Inside, we see the character folder, which contains every file for all the human monsters and pets in the game. In here, look for a folder called Mudraptor and double-click on mudraptor.xml. 
right away you're going to see a wall of XML code. If you find this overwhelming to look at, don't worry, you're not the first. Hang in there though, I promise I'll keep this as straightforward and easy to follow as I can. Think of XML like a family tree. Each node to the tree is called an element, and elements, sometimes called tags, have their own class, and those classes have properties called attributes. Some attributes are mandatory and can be found in every instance of a given class. Most attributes aren't, and that makes those classes more flexible. Some classes can have more elements contained inside them called children. You may have noticed that VS Code has automatically intended, recolored, and stylized the content of the XML file in an attempt to make it easier to read, which I think is pretty cool. Elements are shown in white, their attributes are named in blue, and the values of those attributes are shown in green, with the hierarchy of the elements expressed through indenting. Wherever an element has children, VS Code will have a chevron here, which can be used to fold the code and hide that branch of the tree if desired. By default, all of these branches are expanded when the file is first opened, but VS Code quietly logs whenever you collapse or expand a branch, and if you ever leave that file and come back to it, VS Code will restore the folding as you left it. Pretty cool, huh? But all of this is taken one step further with the XML Tools plugin. Whenever an XML file is being displayed in the editor here, with the XML Tools plugin, you'll see a new bar in the Explorer panel on the left, titled XML Document. This panel has a whole XML file organized in exactly the tree-like format we just discussed. You can collapse these bars or drag the separators between them so to create room as you see fit. For legibility purposes, I've got my font size and zoom level cranked way up, so don't worry if your version doesn't seem as cramped. Now keep in mind, unlike the editor, the XML tree shown here will always start fully collapsed and returns to this state whenever you leave the file. I guess the miracles of modern technology have their limits. Expand this bar by clicking on the chevron and this is where it starts to get really interesting. Right away we see that the root element of this character tree has 20 attributes and 23 children. Any line that starts with this symbol is an element. Any lines that start with an aspirand are attributes. For example, we can see from these attributes that the Mudraptor character can't be infected by husk, it can move in or out of water, and it shows up on sonar. After the list of attributes, you'll see the child elements. This health element here is interesting. It has more useful attributes inside, with like maximum health points, called vitality and a list of attached limb elements with no attributes or children of their own, except for their names. We're going to come back to that in a minute. We're at the bottom of this branch, so let's back up to the root element for just a second. Looking past the health element, we see a handful of emitters which are used for graphics and animation. We see some sound triggers and a handful of inventory elements. We're going to skip the AI element. That's another rabbit hole all on its own. Suffice it to say, it determines where and when and what the mud raptor will attack, what triggers its aggression, whether or not it will actively attempt to board the ship, how it chooses its targets, etc. I want to back up to those mostly empty limb definitions for a second. There are also two notably empty elements nearby, the ragdoll and animation ones here. If we switch back to the file tree, we see that there are folders in the same directory called animations and ragdolls. As far as I can tell, those empty tags trigger the code to look for those folders where it will find more XML files to process. Let's open up the ragdoll XML and see what we find. Switching back to the XML tree, we see a butt-ton of limb elements, followed by an even longer list of joint elements. These limb elements have a lot of attributes, too many to go through in detail, but if you explore a little further, you'll find an element that pops up frequently, something very relevant to our interests today. Damage modifiers. Let's use this first limb, labeled head, as an example. Scroll down to the first appearance of damage modifier, expand this note, and you'll see there's a bunch of important attributes to take note of. One is the affliction types here, damage and bleeding. We're going to discuss afflictions and damage types in the next video, but for now all you need to know is that damage types encompass several forms of damage, and are used to keep the code concise. In cases where damage modifiers apply to one or two specific forms of damage, you'll see those listed here under damage identifiers. For example, the damage group, referred to outside of the code as internal damage, is an umbrella term that collectively refers to seven specific afflictions.
instead of writing those seven identifiers each time, they're grouped together and referred to collectively by the totally not confusing term damage. Another attribute of interest here is the damage multiplier, 1.5. This means that these damage types are multiplied by an extra 50% if they hit this limb. Damage modification is a huge element to combat in barrel trauma, and it's vitally important to understand. Simply put, there's no point in trying to use the pulse laser on an enemy with burn resistance, or the chain gun on something with bullet resistances. Like I said, we're going to talk about damage types and what creatures are resistant or vulnerable to what in the next video. Let's keep exploring the code. Looking closely at these tags here, there's several more lessons to be found. First, damage modifiers are limb specific. This makes sense, for example a Moloch is much more sensitive to damage from behind and below than they are from above, given that their heavily armored shell leaves their more delicate core exposed from the rear. Second, as I mentioned earlier, damage modifiers can apply to more than one type of damage at a time. Third, take note of the armor sector attribute here, and its value 0 to 360. This implies that there's a range of angles to which the damage modifiers are applied, and elsewhere we might find limbs that have different damage modifiers applied to different hits from different directions. Finally, we see that limbs can have multiple damage modifiers, and again each of them has their own list of damage types that they modify, and each modifier has its own arc sector that may or may not overlap the others. Looking at the larger picture here, the Mudraptor, unless you're new to the game, you're probably aware that the Mudraptor is heavily armored. And unless you're using a really, really big gun, you need to blow the armor off to expose the more vulnerable squishy bits underneath. So the next question becomes, how is the armor attached and what requirements must be met to remove it? Sure enough, two limbs down the tree we find the head armor limb. That's right, the head armor is handled just like any other limb. And its damage modifiers reduce burn damage by 75%, internal damage by a whopping 90%, and suppresses bleeding damage entirely. So we now know that the head armor is considered a separate limb, whose animation and rendering is calculated parallel to, but independently from, the head limb that it protects. This is important because it leads into two more major principles to combat in barotrauma, armored limbs and limb severance. Let's look at this from the other side for a second. Open up Barotrauma, fire up the character editor, and load the Mudraptor. Enable the parameters panel and turn on the sprite sheet. Click the head sprite here, and it will overlay the collider for the head on the rendered body, called a ragdoll. Now the size of this collider, also sometimes referred to as the hitbox, is defined by the tangents drawn between these two circles here, and their perpendicular complements. The radius of these two circles and the distance between them is defined here in the code, corresponding to these element attributes here. Now, while there is a minor but significant difference in the location where the head and head armor are anchored, notice that the size of the head armor's collider is larger than the head's. So if we can't hit the head without hitting the armor first, and the armor blocks all this damage, how do we get past it? The answer is limb severance. Let's switch back to VS Code. You may have spotted this attribute here, min severance damage. In the case of our Mudraptor here, it's set to 0.8. In video 3, we'll be exploring the properties of turrets and ammunition, but for now we'll consider a standard coil gun bolt with the sever limbs probability value of 0.25. This means that the coil gun bolt has a 25% chance of severing the head armor from the body, but only if it can surpass the minimum damage threshold of 0.8 after damage modifiers are applied. There's a peculiar mechanic I briefly want to mention before we leave the topic of armored limbs. A piercing coil gun bolt, which sounds more threatening than a traditional coil gun bolt, only does 8 laceration damage and 2 bleeding damage, which barely reaches the severance check damage requirement of 0.8. To make matters worse, this ammunition severance probability is only 10%. Wait, what? The piercing ammunition is the bee's knees for taking down mud raptors, so what gives? Turns out the piercing coil gun ammunition has a unique property, one only shared with spineling quills and latcher teeth. Max targets to hit, aka guaranteed limb penetration. Thankfully for my own sanity, this mechanic is as simple as it is rare, 
If a projectile has this property, it doesn't stop moving through sprites until it's triggered X number of hitboxes. In the case of the piercing coil gun ammunition, that's just two, but in the case of the giant spiling quills, that's ten, and those puppies spawn with twelve quills apiece, so they die first. Now, here's where it gets a little confusing, but thankfully we're running out of damage mechanics, so hang in there. Let's talk about armor penetration. This is where not being afraid to peruse through the GitHub code comes in handy, because this mechanic was otherwise very difficult to explain by the XML files alone. Searching the GitHub repository for the value penetration, a term that pops up all over the place in weapons and ammunition files, we find this epic, crucially placed, and infinitely helpful comment in the CSS code responsible for calculating the effects of an attack. Percentage of damage mitigation ignored when hitting armored body parts, specifically deflecting limbs. Now, there are two major takeaways from that statement. A. It's a straight-up multiplier against damage reduction, and B. It only applies to deflecting limbs. Scrolling back through our XML trees, we find that only armored limbs have this attribute enabled, deflect projectiles. So it appears that damage modifiers for armored limbs only are counter-modified by armor penetration. One more thing to talk about, explosions. In part 3 we'll discuss the difference between on-hit effects, explosions, and shrapnel, but for now I want to talk about explosions in particular. If we hit our unfortunate mud raptor friend here in the head with an explosive round, the explosions radius should overlap the armor and hit the head behind it, right? Well, not exactly. If that were the case, the damage from an explosion would be applied to every body part overlapped by it individually, which might be how you think of it at first, but the coding team at Undertow take their physics very seriously. To explore this further, let's search GitHub for the word explosion. Sure enough, we find a handful of code sections dedicated to this mechanic precisely, and the commenting standards don't disappoint. Check this out. Force applied at a ray is inversely proportional to the square of distance from its source. Huh, that's inverse squared law. The dev's attention to detail and realism never cease to impress me. Query for shapes that may be affected. For each rigid body that is matched, loop through its vertices to determine its extreme points. Evenly cast a number of rays against the shape, and for each ray that actually intersects with the shape, apply the appropriate force dotted with the negative of the collision normal at the collision point. Okay, that was heavily sectioned in paraphrase, but the bottom line is this. Bodies occlude or shield other bodies from explosive effects. If a body is partially shielded, then the effects are calculated to take into account how much of the blast was shielded, where the force of the explosion should be applied to the body in question, and at what angle. Basically, whenever there is an explosion, the game draws a series of rays out in all directions, looking for colliders that get intersected with these rays. If found, the game also checks for bodies in between the source of the explosion and the body in question, and subtracts any rays that are blocked. The remaining rays are summed and divided by the distance squared, and the angle of their effect and the center of force applied are calculated from the resulting vector. Long story short, no, you don't get to bypass armor with explosions. Well, that wraps up part one of this mini-series, and I hope this video has provided you with some insight as to how damage is stacked up in barrel trauma combat and equipped you with the tools to go digging for whatever details catch your interest in the future. In part 2 of the miniseries, we'll explore the different forms of damage found in barrel trauma and examine the European wildlife in great detail, uncovering the code level basis for their weaknesses and resistances and how to leverage these in game. Thanks for watching, and if you're not among the nerds already joined, don't forget to subscribe and mash that tiny bell to be among the first to find out next time I drop another knowledge bomb from the Gaming Nerd. Happy diving!